everyone. My name is Sarah Hausnack. I'm the director of comms at Wilson Sporting Goods. I really appreciate you guys coming to the table today. I've had the opportunity to work with many of you, not all. And I'm very, very excited to get to know those who I haven't. But what I do know already is that all of you guys are masters of your craft. Um, so today we're here to have a discussion about basketball photography because we know shooters shoot. And uh, if we can do a quick around the room and just introduce ourselves. Pass. Uh, Jimmy Longo, I'm a digital content producer. I typically take photos, but I mean that's my main job for the Cavs. Um, it's my third year with the team and just happy to be here. I'm Johnny Esquerdo, uh, commercial editorial photojournalist uh, from New Jersey, but I've been proud and dying to say this. I am living in Nashville, Tennessee, so there it is. I'm Lanes. I'm a videographer, photographer, content creator, hoping to get in cre to creative direction next and hoping to find my next home next. Bye. My name is John Lopez. My jump shot didn't get me to the league, so my snapshot did, and my passion is improving representation behind the lens. Awesome, I love it. Um, so we're gonna focus this conversation on sports photography and especially basketball, but before we do that, I know some of you guys have interesting paths of how you even got into photography. So does anyone wanna share like how you got started, what sort of inspired you to pick up a camera for the first time? Like I'm um, like I'm sure a lot of people go like kind of a traditional route, photo school, video school, whatever it may be. For me, like I know some of you here, mine was untraditional. You know, I went to school for to public relations and business. The job market wasn't great. I fell into a job I didn't love. I hated it. Uh, I was unhappy. I quit. Not really sure what to do. Um, dealing with a lot of late twenties, anxiety, confusion in my direction. Got a camera. It became a hobby. That hobby became an obsession, and then. Met a few people along the way, and then it led me to stages like All-Star Weekend, uh, FIBA World Cup, um, and here to talk with you guys. So that's my journey in a compressed version. Um, I always tell people getting into sports and getting into photography, like my degree's in history. Um, you know, it was one of those things where I was three and a half years into my degree program, and I was like, oh, I don't want to go to law school. So what do I do? I studied abroad for a, you know, a month and I bought a camera to take photos to show my mom, you know, and it turned uh, into a passion, into an obsession. And, you know, I threw myself into unpaid internships and whatever scrap work I could find. And, it, you know, it, it led here. So, I mean, the path is untraditional, but I love it. My route, it, it, was, it was interesting because I started as a journalist. I was writing for my newspaper in college at Iowa State, and I was writing. So visuals didn't really even seem like a thing to me. And I had, I had for some reason had to cover a basketball game at Iowa State. And I know a lot of people, a lot of you may not know about Hilton, which is our Coliseum, which is our arena. But when you step onto that court or you're in that arena, like the energy is unbelievable. And so when I did, when I was, I had to shoot a game, or I got to shoot a game. I was blessed to shoot a game. And from then on, my that's where I began. And they they told me like, Lanes, you're good. Like, put the pen down, keep the camera up. That this is your this is your thing. And from then on, from Iowa State, I went straight to the Chicago Bulls. And I've been working with the Bulls for five seasons now. Amazing. So, you know, my journey took me from the playgrounds of New York City to the Rio Olympics and to Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena. And I was just determined, you know. Like I said, my jump shot didn't get me to the league. I aspired to play at a high level, as high as I possibly could. And when David Stern didn't call my name, he had lost my phone number at the time. I didn't have a cell phone. It was, it was a simple miscommunication, clearly. But after that miscommunication, I decided I need to find another way to really keep myself involved in the game that I love. And so I directed my vision toward the playgrounds because I knew that that was an area that wasn't getting the attention I thought it deserved. And I always strived to bring that professionalism from the NBA and the professional ranks to the playgrounds in my communities that I thought were just overlooked and underrepresented. I wanted to kind of shine a light and a spotlight on them. And I'm proud to say that since then, I think a lot of photographers have kind of shifted in that direction and have given a lot of these uh, grassroots programs and leagues and parks and playgrounds the respect that it deserves. So I'm proud of that. I know you guys all create a little bit different kinds of content, but I guess um, as a non-photographer or videographer, um, to me it seems like action would be way harder to capture. 
Um, so can you guys talk a little bit about sort of the differences between shooting in a studio, trying to capture, photo uh, excuse me, I should say action photography, and really um, what are the challenges of each? Um, to me, it seems like people in motion would be way more difficult, but maybe I'm wrong. I feel like studio photography is its own moment because you have the studio lights, you have the backdrops, you have to get the backdrops to work. Also, too, if you're working with athletes who are six feet and above, and you're, I'm 5'2", <laughs> I'm 5'2", so like having to fit a backdrop for an athlete that is like twice my height, like, or what, you know what I mean? Like, that's a lot. So there's a lot that goes into studio photography um, versus an action photography. Also, too, with action photography, you get into these kind of grungy gyms with the yellow lighting. You've got to figure out how you're going to make it work when they're moving, too. So there's, I mean, there's just so many elements to, to all the things that we do, but that's kind of just a glimpse into, into my life, into my experience, just a very quick moment, but I'm sure they have amazing thing, amazing and crazy things, I'm sure, to say as well. I think also, too, it's like, you can tell a story with both, but I love commercial, like the one-on-one -on -one shoots, but you have to be able to kind of read the room there and, you know, the temperature, and sometimes athletes or a subject may not want to be there the whole time, or maybe they don't want to do a certain pose, or maybe they were on an overnight flight, so it may depend, but obviously there's challenges, you know, you want to, it's, it's different with, with, with studio and commercial work because there's lighting, there's, there's assistance, there's a whole set involved, there's a whole like concept going into it. As to like when you're on the court, sometimes it's reactionary. You still got to make beautiful images, but you know, you can't tell LeBron to, if he's going to dunk it, he's going to dunk it, you know, versus, so I think they both have a cool really avenue and you can tell really awesome stories with both. Um, but I think as photographers, you know, we're not just, it's not supposed to be easy. We're supposed to make the tough situations come to light and be make it look, make the client be like, "Oh wow, that's amazing." Even though it may be challenging. So, I think shooting a basketball game is you know probably top two or three things. It's not being a professional athlete or not being a basketball player, but being too close to being one, right? Like, I can't coach, I can't shoot, <laughs> but I know the teams and I know the players that I'm watching enough to know that if I see one guy go another way my peripheral will tell me that the other guy is rolling to the rim and there could either be a, a layup or a dunk, right? Yeah. So the anticipation of it makes it like, at least action sports photography, a competitive aspect to it that I think that, you know, a lot of other like mediums of photography don't have. And I think that's really cool. I like that perspective. I think with action, you know, it's funny, but the athlete and the, the documentarian or the photographer are kind of in sync, right? The two of them are together bonded by ball when you really think about it, right? It's, it's that connection that has to exist. Well played. I appreciate you. I see well what done. I did there? Yeah. Just yep. finish that. I got you. And so between that, it's about capturing those peak moments and really showing that empowerment and making sure that they're shining in their, in their greatest light, you know? And not every photo is a great one. And we've all, I, I'll speak for myself, I've taken tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of terrible photos and I've learned from every single one but it's having that dance, right? Basketball truly is poetry in motion. And, you know, being able to kind of capture that and, and kind of harness some of that and interpret it through my lens, right? Uh, you know, mentally and literally, um, I think that's kind of the way it works for me. We can be, like us four can be on the sidelines together, right? And we've had conversations, me and John off the camera about this, like we can us four be on the sideline at the same time, but we can get four different images. Yeah. And it could be the same, I'll just use LeBron, like he's going for the dunk, but we can get four different looks and different moments. So I think that's a really beautiful thing that not yeah. a lot of people even know. And it's, it's cool to see it when you see it unfold and you're like, oh, wow, look. You know. Speaking of looking, I couldn't help but notice you removed your jacket to show us the cover shot you did for Slam Magazine. I want you to know I am thrilled that you were able to do that. And that's a beautiful cover, man. Good job. Sometimes a John, I don't know if he's, he takes digs at me or he's complimenting me, but no. it's like a... I think with that, so obviously an iconic moment there, um, and I know iconic is often a Johnny word, yeah. so I'm going to actually ask you guys, what is the most iconic moment to date that each of you has captured? I know that's very hard to choose. I anticipated this question, and I, and I thought of what it would be, but you want to go? Johnny had, that's the shirt, you shot that cover. Yeah. I shot this month's All-Star Edition cover. Wow. So. Very outside cool. of like you know i think sports photography like it's second nature now like I, everybody messes everybody misses but to push myself and get a slam cover and you know execute a, a studio shoot that's probably that's up there yeah. studio shoots are tough man it's like you know to be there and you know that you you don't have that much time and it's like you know posing them the lights got to be right it's it's a lot it's very difficult you know for sure let's talk about your favorite shots so what do you got 
okay. And it's it's not from a camera. Like it was from my iPhone. Okay. And I hope that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, there's kind of no rules in these kind of moments. It's, we're at dinner. We're you know we're we're hanging out. We're <laughs> you know we're chilling. Family reunion. Um, so it was actually last no two year two years at All Star when it was in Chicago. Michael Jordan had walked in. I was at Michael Jordan's birthday party, and I didn't have my camera because most of the time, like, you will not find me like out. I'm gonna be like working, editing, at the crib. That's it. So the one time I got dragged out, it was for Michael Jordan's birthday party. Yes, I'm gonna be there. So I pulled up to the goat's birthday party. Everything was like branded, 23. Got the shoes. Like it was fire. Anyways, he walks in. You know, he's crazy. Like he walking in, like MJ. He's there for his birthday party. It's, it was wild. Well, okay, that's but that's not even it. So Michael Reinsdorf, who's connected to the Bulls, if you know, of course, franchise duh. He walks in and ha they handshake, and I got, like, I'm right there like iPhone. My, at the time, I had like an iPhone 8, maybe. I'm like, like snapping, cause I'm like, man, if only I had my camera. But it was like at the same time, like I still captured that moment because I feel like as photographers, videographers, storytellers, storytellers. That's that's what really what we are. It's, it doesn't matter what we have in our hand. It's 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 telling that story, telling that moment. And for me, like that was the most incredible shot I took. Even though it was on my iPhone, I yeah. still had that story, that moment. That's awesome. You know, uh, Johnny likes to make fun of me. I got photos of him that are blurry, but I think they're beautiful photos. And he judges me about the blurriness of my images. But I've captured many moments that I think, you know, you really get the, the visceral feeling of what that moment is. And whether it's from a, you know, your mobile device or from a ten thousand dollar, you know, expensive camera. It really doesn't matter. Either the vibe is there or it's not. Because you can also have that $10,000 camera and make a bunch of terrible images. Yes. I'm definitely guilty of that too, but <laughs> that's just the way it is. The one you have, right? Like, I always tell young photographers, like, you don't need, you don't need to, you know, blow your savings. You need to get a lens and a camera and make it work and go from there. Um, I'd say my favorite photo, thinking on it, you know, last year, uh, it was the first game after James Harden got traded to Brooklyn, right? So it was Kyrie, it was Harden. It was Durant, and they played in Cleveland after we had just gotten J.A. in that deal. Um, you know, tight game back and forth. Uh, you know, Colin Sexton gets the ball. We're down three near the end of regulation, and he hits a three over Kyrie to send the ball game into overtime, right? And my photo, you know, you can see the details of Kyrie's face. You can see the hand right in Colin Sexton's grill, but you can also see the two on the back, you know, Colin being the first person to wear two since Kyrie. Yeah, yeah the most like you know it's a normal photo for me to take but it had the most detail and most meaningful yeah. you know for the Cavs as a franchise but for you know me as a photographer awesome. at that point that's a really cool story yeah, yeah cool I, uh, you want to go or you good I think for me too it's like I think of that question like my best photo and I, I've kind of like danced with so many different ones so for me it's more like a moment in my life like I said like you guys all went an untraditional route so when I was like bartending and, and taking pictures, I wasn't sure if this was gonna be a real thing for me. And then um, there was a job that I got uh, to photograph Kevin Durant on, on this plane. He's sponsored by Alaska Airlines, and they were, it was a really cool concept. Nike was picking up three different high schools from LA, Oakland. This is when he was on Golden State and Vegas, and they were surprising the high school kids with him on the plane. He was like the, the stewardess, the flight attendant. Excuse me, the flight attendant. <laughs> Apologize. So he he's reading in first class with his, with his feet up, like he's reading a letter from a fan, and I just like caught this like really candid moment with his like legs up, and like just for me, I think at that moment it was just like, man, I can do this, and I don't think I need to question myself. Um, so that's that's my that's my my my, my remembrance photo that's good, that I felt like was a, a changer for me. A sense of validity is really important, right? I think we probably yeah. all have had a moment where we had this sense like. I can do this, my work is valued, I'm contributing, I'm adding value to the, to the community and the fabric of the game. Such a beautiful thing. I think also, I try to keep it brief, there's so many moments that stand out for me, you know, in my career. Cause like I said, I, I went from the playgrounds, I, I didn't have contacts at, at FIBA or the NBA or NCAA or Nike or any of the, Wilson, right? Like, you know, I didn't know anybody there to be able to say, oh, let me just shoot these campaigns and do these cool jobs. And so for me, it, it goes back to the playgrounds. You know, in 2009, I captured a photo from a rooftop um, of a championship game at Dykeman up in Washington Heights in New York City and no one had ever photographed that park and that moment from that vantage point before and I had scouted it and I, take, I had taken a few photos and, and didn't share them with anybody because I knew the championship was going to be the optimal time and when I did that 
it was published as a double truck image in Bounce Magazine, the first magazine to publish my work ever, and then it ended up being licensed by Nike, and it was published in magazines all around the globe, um, and that's kind of how I got my foray into you know doing work with big brands and kind of helping out, and what, what led me to, to the Wilson shoot, I think, ultimately. Were you, so, so that, like, were you just like, hey, let me go check that out? Like, because you you've been on the playgrounds. So was it just like a, hey, let me go try that out? No, I wish I was that smart and that creative all by myself. The truth is, it's a collaboration, right? We're bonded by board. There's so much to it. I was working with uh, the folks at Bounce Magazine at the time as a writer, and uh, one of the editors and co-founders of it, Sean Couch, amazing brother from New York, you know, deeply rooted in the basketball community there. Um, he said, man, you know, it'd be really cool to try to get an elevated shot. I wonder if there's access to a roof around here. And so from that point on, I, I took it upon myself to ask a, a young person in the community, like, hey, can you let me in this building? And I, and I rose to the yeah. top. Yeah, free drones, free yeah. drones, that's right. Awesome, it's amazing. Now, you guys obviously all just talked about like everybody can really be a content creator today with iPhones. So is, is speed something you guys need to think about when you're thinking about turning around content, whether it's for events or you know games? Um, literally everyone has their phone out during these events now. So how does um, speed play a role or a factor in what you guys do? Right, like uh, working games, you know, we don't use traditional like tethering methods to send photos. So I use, and I'm sure everyone that works in like social media sports has one and sports in general, but like I use the lightning SD card reader. I, I shoot a photo. It's worth going on social. I send it to my phone. I edit it, send it to social. And, you know, I take my card from my, from my iPhone, right? Like who would have thought 10 years ago that iPhones would have been the editing method for you know, sports photographers, professional sports photographers. And, I mean, it's it's huge for how fast uh, I'm able to get photos out. I think that's the thing too, like you said, uh, the difference between like a commercial studio shoot or lifestyle shoot versus a game. You know, if it's a game, you can have methods like that. You can file transfer images instantly just because the world's so quick, quick, quick. But you know, obviously on the other end with commercial stuff, it can be a little bit more, I like to shoot tethers so when I shoot, people can see it on the screen, but usually clients would be like, you can take a little bit more time with it because there's release dates and usually you can send it to them and they'll send it back. So it depends the world you're in. You know, if you're in, in a game action, then it's moving high, pa high, fa um, high pace, like he said. And if it's like commercial and brand related, then it could be a little bit more controlled and, and kept. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. And I think too, communication, communicating with whoever you're working with. Is there a deadline? When's the deadline? Also, too, exceeding that deadline, showing that, hey, like, even if your deadline is the next day, I can get them to you tonight. And, you know what I mean? And, and building that relationship, building, you know, that, that rapport. But I think just communication and it just really just depends on what, what the shoot is, for sure. I think in sports, you know, first of all, I'm always aiming to try to capture something that can last more than just in that moment. You know, I'm trying to find something that's going to have stopping power and that's going to last for a long time. But at the same time, understanding that the needs of the client and the world, they really want to see this thing. And sometimes that moment can pass, right? You can't, for example, if you're shooting a, a Chicago Bulls game, you're not going to wait to the third quarter to show that really cool stretching photo, right, during the pregame warm-up, right? There's, there's the right time and place for that image. It might be a timeless image that's iconic, you know what I mean? The Bulls doing so great right now, right? You have this amazing photo of DeRozan or Zach Levine or whoever, and, and it might last forever, but in that game, nobody wants to see DeMar DeRozan stretching in the third quarter, right? Unless he got hurt or something like that, which we all hope doesn't happen. So, you know, time, time is everything, and I, I think one of the things is efficiency. And I think one of the things that I've used as a separating factor for me as a professional photographer is being able to deliver those kinds of images faster than the next person next to me. And I think that's really been something that I've taken pride in that's given me an advantage. Because like Johnny said earlier, the four of us in the same baseline, we might get the same shot sometimes. It might look like the four of us are in four different arenas, depending on the image, you know, it all depends, but it's gonna come down to like, how are we delivering those images and how are we making that easier on the client side for them to be able to access those images and do what they need to do with those. Yeah. Now, um, who, if you guys could only shoot like one person that you haven't already shot, who would it be? Say again. Usain Bolt, 100%. Okay. Do they have to okay. be alive? Uh, no. Let's, yeah. Mine, I thought of this. Mine's Usain Bolt, like, without a question. Why? I just, I'm obsessed with track and field. Okay. Uh, I, and I don't know. I just, <laughs> I've asked, somebody's asked me that question before, and I was like, if I can do Usain Bolt, a portrait of him, I'm good. I would say I'd retire after that, but we know that I'm going to do that and want the next thing anyway, so, but I, yeah, he's my number one, for sure. 
mine's coming. Um, mine's more of like a collab though. Okay. So I'm originally from St. Louis, and so Jason Tatum, Bradley Beal, and then Drew Hanlon, he's a basketball skills trainer. But that's cool, right? Like I would get them like training in the gym, but, and I'm speaking this into existence. Like when this happens, we'll see like, I'm, we, they play with the Wilson ball, it's gonna, it's gonna be yeah. lit. So for the music, Metro Boomin, if y'all know who Metro Boomin is, his slogan is Metro Boomin wants some more. He's from St. Louis too, I went to high school with him. So he like, he would be like on the tunes. So Jason and Bradley would be like hooping, Drew would be training them with the Wilson balls mm -hmm. and the Metro on the beats. And it's a whole St. Louis collab. I love and it. That's, that's love my it. dream, that's my dream. Hi. Speak it into existence, right? Amen, sis. First, ladies and gentlemen, lanes <laughs> will make this happen. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really have one. Um, you know, I think, I'd like to shoot older NBA athletes, uh, you know, but I, I go back in time kind of thing, right? Like I think it'd be super dope to have the technology and the, the thought process behind photography that we do now, um, but be able to shoot, you know, like the Larry Birds and Magic Johnsons, like that kind of shoot, the same kind of, uh, you know, artisticness behind, you know, some of the athletes and some of the, you know, the concept shoots that we do nowadays would be super dope. I have a few, but I'm gonna be quick, all right? First and foremost, I would love to be able to have photographed Earl the Goat Manigault. That's, that's number one. I would love to have photographed that double dunk that we all know happened on him touching, changing the dollar for four quarters on the top of the backboard. I would love to have been the person who captured that, right? Muhammad Ali, the greatest athlete of all time, across all barriers, sports, and all of that. Would love to photograph him. Serena Williams, the goat of goats. Um, yeah, I have a few. Pee Wee Kirkland, Joe Hammond, the destroyer. You know, all the playground legends before my time. Skip to my Lou, I just missed him. I would love to have photographed Skip to my Lou. I would love to have photographed the game that never happened at Rucker Park, the blackout game, where Shaq and Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming and LeBron James were all supposed to suit up at Rucker Park. The game that never happened. I wish that I was on the sideline to, to capture that moment. That's awesome. D definitely a ton of uh, great, great options there. None, none to be short. Um, thank you guys, honestly, for coming to the table and really having this discussion with Wilson today. Um, this is our All-Star Weekend family reunion, and we appreciate all of you guys being a part of our basketball family. So Jimmy, Johnny, Lanes, and John, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, we are truly bonded by ball, as you have said multiple <laughs> times. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Great to be here.